Hello everyone, this is Supreme Decisions, and this is the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. Well, today we're doing something a little different. Not necessarily, but this is going to be the episode that's going to be going out on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and I want to do it with a video this time, because I haven't done that in a while. And I'm probably going to be doing a couple more podcasts this week. Simply to kind of catch up and get us back on track to where we were going. Because you know, at one point, we were talking about weaponizing your defense. Putting us in better positions to actually defend ourselves. And also getting more in-depth in the actual law context and even concepts of... Not necessarily greater understanding, but more aggressive application, but also starting to understand those that are applying the legal system against us. And today is something that I wanted to address. Well, it's actually an older topic because I've kind of pointed on to it in the last, I want to say, two or three podcasts that were back in March. But this one is also going to deal with qualified immunity and a couple of applications. But I'm going to give you a couple of nuances that I didn't give you in the first three. And I hope you guys are ready. Got your headphones on because it is in stereo. You got your yak. Well, I don't have any yak tonight. I have my Arizona sweet tea. Well, it's actually RX Energy, but it's still Arizona. And I hope you guys are ready to actually improve the audio because I actually had to get a couple things together. But what we're going to do is now get a deeper understanding of what the context of qualified immunity is and some of the verbiage you will have to compete with when dealing with police officers and suing them. And most commonly under under a 42 U.S.C. 1983 Act or as a cause of action. So, let's get ready. Now, qualified immunity. Under the doctrine of qualified immunity, government officials are protected from damages, liability, and suits brought under the 42 U.S.C. 1983. Now, here's one of the caveats. So long as their conduct did not violate a clearly established right of which a reasonable officer would have known. Now, why do I highlight that? Because in the videos prior you heard, or in the podcast prior, you heard me state clearly established, clearly established, clearly established. Now you have to understand the context of what clearly established actually means. Well, so much for the video for right now because my phone overheated. But what we're going to do is actually get an understanding that their training and level of intelligence is one of the acts of clearly established and reasonable would have known. Now, I'm going to go into a couple of um, body cam videos that were supplied to me from people that I've helped or been working with over the past few years. In which I'm going to illustrate qualified immunity being melted away. I'm also going to show or illustrate the reasonable officers would have known and the why. Because I'm going to understand, because again, the G.I. Joe context, knowing is half the battle. What we know is that they're not hiring intelligent people, right? So as the context of that. We are going to keep moving forward as if we don't have to worry about that.
right? So what is reasonable to the everyday man and woman may not be considered reasonable to a police officer. Why? Because we're dealing with an intelligence factor. Jordan B. City of Prince, Philadelphia. Always have to understand that. I go into that because whether we like it or not, there is a certain level and there are certain guidelines for IQ and Denson for the most part. And I'm pretty sure I mispronounced that word. But you understand what it is that I'm saying. And police fall into a category of below 107 and below. And their actions illustrate the 107 and below. Because one of the things I often talk about are the acts of human nature. Because again, those are things that we already know. Because these are sciences that are done by the FBI. Because there are certain actions that a certain mentality does not allow you to break away from. Because even it's done through habitual evidence. And then it's done through test subjects. Those test subjects would be the highest domestic violence. Those that are going into these negative situations because... Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transferred. But it has to come from an external source. And police officers are constantly going into negative situations. We also talk about the simple fact that they also are not given by the police force means of releasing that negative energy. Which also gives you the context of understanding that reasonableness reason of thought is going to be different between an adult and a toddler that's why when we talk about the reasonableness of an officer would have known one of the things that I'm actually going to speak on later is the simple fact that you have officers here in Texas in order to be certified in Texas they have to go to school and qualify for 11 months and two weeks. Yes, it is long as hell. It is almost, literally almost a year. They get two weeks off. They don't even get a summer break. It's 11 months, two weeks to be certified as a police officer in Texas. Now, reasonably, and also I know one of the case law that they are well versed on is... Terry B. Ohio. Remember, years ago, literally, I did a breakdown of the context of Terry B. Ohio. One of the things that they are taught in Terry B. Ohio is how to manipulate. Because we've been copaganded or programmed to believe cops can do certain things. Some people have been programmed to believe that cops don't make mistakes. Which is the most dangerous thing that anyone could believe. But in those confines, they are trained on Terry v. Ohio. Now, as I go through this, you're going to learn how that case or case law or application goes to the mindset of a reasonable officer. Because we can't use that exact same terminology in a place such as Georgia. Georgia's police officer training is six weeks long. And there are no actual qualifications. Because as long as you make it through the six weeks, you're probably going to be certified. Because that's why Georgia is the worst policing system in the country. Because they are not reasonable in their training. So the reasonableness from an officer in Texas is not going to be the same as the reasonableness of an officer in Georgia. Always understand those things. And but neither one of those are going to be on the level of someone that is an educated adult. Educated will be someone that has got some beyond high school learning. Technical. Going through college. Someone along those lines. 
those reasonableness standards would not apply because they would be on an elevated plane based on a police officer. Simply based on the understanding of Jordan v. City of Prince. Now, a plaintiff challenging qualified immunity must point to precedent that squarely governs the facts at issue. Now, here's where a lot of people get caught up because they get caught up in their feelings. And I always tell people, the reason why you don't have a surgeon working on someone they love is because they can't work on them objectively. I'm going to say that again. The reason why you don't have a surgeon producing surgery on someone they love is because they are no longer objective. They're in their feelings when they're doing their job, and most people can't separate it. Now, what do I mean by that? Most people get to the point of they have a situation happen, the first thing they do, I'm going to write an affidavit because I want you to hear my side. They have no idea how that affidavit works, and then why would you give someone in a contested anything the answers to the test because that's what an affidavit does it gives you entire stress and then you're telling people who don't care because they're the one that gave you the problem now they know what you're going to do and guess what they no longer have to do because they see that you want to tell your side not hold them accountable for the things they should have done, which is their law, which is their code, which are their ordinances, which are their restrictions. Holding them responsible because as the plaintiff, they are the ones who have to prove everything. They are the accuser. So when you're doing these, it has nothing to do with your side. It has everything to do with who, what, when, where, why, how. You know, the thing you learn in third grade. The situation, not just the subject. Because we could talk about, oh, I was illegally searched. Well, give me the context of that search. Well, he pat me down. Was there implied consent? Or did you actually use the words, I do not consent? Because then those are separate variables those are the things that can apply context now it becomes not just your word against theirs it becomes hey you didn't do this right because you didn't follow your procedures and here are the guidelines for that here is the pretext for that here is the case law for that and this is what I'm looking for because of that and Kelsey B. Ernest, because an, an officer who performed a takedown maneuver on a non-violent, non-threatening, non-fling misdemeanor was entitled to qualified immunity on the basis that the law surrounding the officer's use of force was not clearly established. Now, I'm going to go deeper into that case because it was a clever argument. Is because one of the things that happened in my RICO case, they called me a domestic terrorist. They called me a sovereign citizen. They, oh, he's a he's an outright thief. I was actually, I was actually, I was, I was actually kind of, kind of smiling because one of the, I was the concierge of crime because a lot of the people that I was helping were actually getting off on things that were not crimes, but they were criminalizing, you know, like traffic tickets or someone living in their own home. I'm a able to stop a foreclosure because the foreclosure itself was illegal. I was able to do things that most people are told could not be done. People were losing their children and they had to be returned. Why? Because it was not done properly. And so I became a concierge. Because here's the second part of that. I was not emotionally invested in the situation. 
I only cared about the outcome. I'm going to say that one more time because, again, I didn't write any affidavits because I didn't care about your side, neither did they. I was not emotionally invested in that situation. All I cared about was the outcome. So that's what I worked towards. But understanding that, this is why when you're putting things together, you don't put it together for your own being. You're putting it together for the justice that you are seeking. Now, courts have had difficulty applying qualified immunity consistently as figuring out what a reasonable officer should have known and what level of speciality a legal principle has been established that can devolve into almost metaphysical exercise. Because what happens, because again, let me, let me finish the original thought before I went into that. Because what happens is, just like in Kelsey B. Ernest, the prosecutor is not looking to answer everything that they are accusing you of. They're looking for something to throw you off balance. One of the things that I constantly did whenever I was going through uh, my RICO trial, even after it was a joke because I did a um, breast cancer video, and during, on the set, I constantly said, I need you to stay focused. I actually said that in court. I need you to stay focused. Because I was questioning a police officer, and he went to a tangent about something I didn't ask him. But again, he wanted the jury to hear something. But in that same instance, I allowed him to go on that tangent. Why? Because I wanted them to see something. I wanted them to see that he was trying to avoid the question. So when I told him, I need you to stay focused, and I re-asked the question, they saw him evading. Just as he, he wanted them to hear him say something to criminalize me, I wanted them to see him blatantly avoid a question. Because again, this is chess, not checkers. And a lot of times people are playing checkers because they are told this is checkers. They are told that this is easy when in fact they're speaking a different language. You're putting on a show. You're performing. You're performing an art. Because that's what it is. This legal nuance is an art form. There are a lot of people that do art. There are very few savants. There are very few people that do it at a high level. Because they don't understand the nuances of the art. But this is where the separation comes in. Because again, even when I'm speaking about this, I've been saying the same thing literally for years. There are literally Hundreds of videos online where I'm speaking about who, what, when, where, why, how. I'm talking about exigent circumstance. I am talking about show of authority stop. I am talking about case law that's clearly established, that has been used to win. But people still want to push back because they're trying to bend the spoon. They're not trying to see what I show them because if you see what I show you, it requires your mind to expand to something else and it takes you somewhere you have never been. But that's what this is. It's the understanding that Clearly established is a statement. It is something that you have to illustrate. 
it is part of the art itself, but it's also understanding specificity. It's when I talked about art is not or law is not subjective, it's situational. That's why you have so many cases that fall under Terry v. Ohio. Terry v. Ohio set a precedent. Arizona v. Grant set a precedent. All of these cases that I give you set a precedent. But inside those give you the clearly established. But you have now the nuance of the reasonableness of an officer. You have to now understand the context of the character that you're going against. And what the last statement meant was every judge makes their determination differently. And even at different times. Elections. After some mass event. Hell, after a mass shooting. Political views. And favors. Or even loyalties. Because... A lot of people didn't catch the, catch the wave. Because many people didn't even figure out right prior to, I want to say right around 2021. It, start, it started around 2017. But 2021 to the very first part of 2023, it was sewer cop season. Sewer cops, because the political pressures of getting rid of bad cops. And they kept saying, well, I can't do it because my hands are tied. It's the police unions. Supreme Court said, hey, you can sue the unions now. So they said, you know what? We're going to give you a sacrificial lamb. We're going to give you Amanda uh, Amber Geiger. We're going to give you Kim Porter, who's now home. We're going to give you Derek Chauvin. We're actually going to give you was the name Tao. And I guarantee you most people didn't even know Tao got convicted last week for the murder of George Floyd. Last week. It didn't make news. But it happened. But again, it was things that I said prior to that most people missed or attempted to discredit. But it's understanding I'm seeing something. I'm seeing the pieces because any good magician says, look at my hand, look at my hand, look at my hand, while the trick is being performed on the other side. I've been trained to actually look at the other side. I'm not paying attention to what you're showing me. I'm giving you something that you don't want me to see or that you hope I'm not paying attention to. Now, I'm going to go, let, let me move on. While the misdemeanor act of walking away could be interpreted as flight, viewing the facts as the light favorable to her, she was not fleeing, nor was she violent, threatening, resisting arrest, or ignoring commands. The great part about this is, remember I told you about the reasonableness of the officer. I talked about the training in Texas for police certification. I talked about the training in Georgia for police certification. I also talk about the difference. All is well within one's God-given rights to walk away from the police. It's part of the restrictions us goodness. It's part of restrictions set as clearly established Supreme Court decisions of Florida v. Royer. And my favorite. Because even if they don't understand it, you don't have to talk to them. All of them swore to that trust document. And that trust document has an amendment called the Fed. 
Dave Chappelle. Fifth. The fifth. To not participate in a police investigation and remain silent. Because most people don't understand and most police officers aren't trained on the simple fact that they are servants unless there is a crime. That they must be able to articulate. I'm going to say that one more time. They are servants until there's a crime. They have no authority until there's a crime. I know a few of y'all actually wonder why, why I had this dramatic pause. But the whole context of it is to understand the totality of circumstances. It is a must. It is a requirement. And police rarely perform their duties as required. Which is why you have something such as Mallory V. Briggs. Because they can't determine probable cause on their own. Which is again, why they need consent from you. Because they are servants to you. And if you do not offer them consent. I'm going to say that one. If you do not offer them permission. They then have to get permission from a judge. Unless there's exigent circumstances. If you do not offer them consent. They then must get permission from a judge. Why? Because totality of circumstances, the intelligence factor, they can't determine probable cause on their own. Mally B. Briggs. I would love to say that these are my sayings. Like, yeah, police aren't intelligent. No, Jordan B. Prince told me that. Jordan B. Prince told me that police aren't intelligent. Jordan B. Prince told me that the police across this country are not hiring intelligent people. You know what else? The clearly established Mally V. Briggs set the precedent of that actual decision when it stated they need to go to a judge when they don't have consent because they cannot determine, even after performing totality of circumstance, they cannot determine what probable cause is on their own. Because even in the Kelsey case, Kelsey was at a pub the pool in Wymore, Nebraska, with her three children and her friend Patrick. Patrick at one point came over behind Kelsey and threw her into the pool. Now, Drake told me the hardest thing about business is minding your own. Well, Cassie found that out the hard way. Patrick was accused of assaulting her. I'm gonna note that we're not talking about Patrick Castlin, V. Ernest. We're not talking about Patrick Castle. So, if Melanie Kelsey was the victim, how is she also the one making the lawsuit? Well, I'm about to get to that. Because remember, I told you the police do not perform the totality of circumstances as required. But apparently, they're also not intelligent enough to understand why they're there. But here we go. People thought that Caseline was assaulting um, Melanie. So they called the police. Police showed up and they attempted to arrest Patrick. Well, now the victim, in their mind, because that's what they were told, who they did not interview, Say that one more time because that's part of the totality of circumstance. 
They have a victim that they have not interviewed, but they place someone in under arrest. Let that sink in. Have a victim that they haven't interviewed, but they're placing someone under arrest. The victim says, no, we were playing around at the pool. He didn't assault me. It was not an assault. We were joking, playing, <laughs> having fun. She stood in front of the police car and they actually ignored her. They ignored the victim who they have yet to interview, who they are charging this man for assaulting. Let's keep this going. Deputy Matt Ernest says, I'm going to arrest her because she is not talking to me. And she began to walk away from him. They've already arrested someone, have yet to speak to the victim. And then after the victim tells them she's not a victim, they ignore her. They call more police officers to the scene. So she now leaves the scene and they're upset that she's not talking to them. Let that sink in. She told them she was not a victim. She told them there was no altercation as was reported. Police did not listen to the victim. They actually put that in Matt Ernest. Deputy Matt Ernest put in his report he did not listen to the victim. So when she walked away, he got upset because she kept talking to him and talking to him and talking to him and talking to him. He didn't pay her no attention. So she's like, why the fuck do I keep talking to him? Why am I talking to this dude? She turns around and walks away. He doesn't like that. She is now not listening to him. He runs over, bear hugs her, throws her to the ground, rendering her unconscious and fracturing her collarbone. Deputy Matt Ernest is a bad cop. I'm going to say that one more time, just in case anybody did not catch that. Deputy Matt Ernest was called to the scene of a assault. Deputy Matt Ernest did not perform totality of circumstances. Deputy Matt Ernest put in his report he did not listen to the victim who told him she was not assaulted. She was not a victim. When that victim chose to now not pay Matt Ernest any attention because he did not listen to her after he had already arrested someone for assaulting her. He bear hugged her, threw her to the ground, rendering her unconscious and fracturing her collarbone. But she was the problem. Matt Ernest is a bad cop. Now, what happened in this is she exercised her right to remain silent because she wasn't being listened to. She stated she is not the victim. And the reason they were there was clearly established. She was supposedly assaulted. She did not call for help. She was at a pool enjoying herself and nosy people called. She was exercising a clearly established right in Florida v. Royer. An individual, when approached, has the right to ignore the police and go about his or her business. Florida v. Royer. An individual, when approached, has the right to ignore the police and go about their business. She did that because she, con she constantly tried to let Matt Ernest know, no, I was not assaulted. Why are you arresting someone? No, I was not assaulted. I am not a victim. 
but you have someone in cuffs. And then when he wants to talk, she's like, yeah, fuck you, I'm good. But here's where the two-part qualified immunity test goes into effect. Now, at the end of this, at the end of this you're going to hear me say something. It's going to be in the conjunction of three instead of two. And I'm going to tell you why. Because whenever I told you we're going to do this, we're going to weaponize your defense. That's exactly what I mean. Because this is going to, part of this is going to be put up um, in the master class section when you join. Um, I believe it right now until June is going to be $100 a month. It's going to be raised because it's been $100 a month for, I want to say, a year. And, or well, actually two years. And I've got a base thing on there, which is discovery. The foundational stuff is on the discovery and even a follow-up. But what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to delete those videos. I'm going to do a whole new thing because, for whatever reason, people don't feel the foundation is worth it. When, in fact, those are the things that win case. Because it's how you start. And the context of going through. That's what gets you to the next level. But let me keep going. Because part one of a two-part qualified immunity test is whether the officer violated constitutional right. Generally, that's the easy. Because if you're in Georgia, we're going to go ahead and check that box as yes. We're going to go ahead and check that. that that's, that's, pretty much a, that's pretty much a given. That's why they're the worst in the country. I'm going, to, I'm going to say that. Six weeks, they're not teaching you anything. and They don't really care about anything else because they're graduating people that have no business being police officers. Now, if you're in Georgia, yes. In Texas, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to hear some more, right? Two, is whether that right was clearly established at the time of the incident. Now, Again, I told you at the end, I'm going to give you something else. But we're just going to go with those two for right now. But I'm going to slide something in. Was that right clearly established at the time of the incident in that circuit area? Because you understand you have circuit, um, the 8th circuit, the 11th circuit, the 5th circuit. Because I'm actually in the 5th circuit. That's why I threw that in there. But those questions need to be answered. And generally, if it's one of the circuit's um, decisions, they're going to more often go with that if it goes with that situation. Now, what happened in the Kelsey's case was she then began to sue because she was actually charged. They charged her. And she was the victim. She was the reason they were there. But... Matt didn't care. Matt said he wanted to live out his WWE fantasy. But in person v. Callahan, a court need not answer both questions. So long as the answer to either question is no, the officer is not held liable. Now, what that actually means is for you to get rid of qualified immunity, both Answers must be yes. I'm going to say that again. In order for you to get rid of qualified immunity, both answers must be yes. Now, you can't get a yes from an affidavit. You cannot get yeses to... Whether the officer violated a constitutional right or whether that right was clearly established at the time of the incident from an affidavit because an affidavit is testimony. But it was signed under penalty of perjury. Has nothing to do with the accusations. Has nothing to do with the actual actions. You're giving witness testimony. That's it. And it doesn't get activated. But you know what? I'll give you that later too. 
Because at the end of the day, you have to get yeses. That's what I'm here for, to get you to those yeses. It may seem like, you know what, what I'm going to get back on it because I'm going to need me to stay focused. But I want you to catch something. We're so used to hearing no. And the things I talk about require you to not only change. You know, I force you to see that there's no spoon. But they don't want you to know that there's no spoon. Because I am bending your mind. I am retraining the things that you know. Because the things that I'm telling you are written. You can go find them. The things that they're telling you, they hope you believe just because they said it. And a lot of times because you've heard it said so many times that you would rather just believe what you hear versus what you see. So whenever you get to a point of hearing something, you stop listening. I'm going to say that one more time. When you're so deep in the programming that you hear something that's familiar, you stop listening to what they're actually saying. Now, when you talked about Kelsey, one of the things that Ernest said, Matt Ernest said, was that she was resisting because she was walking away and wasn't talking to him. Resisting requires acts of violence or aggression. He never said, that's why, I, what is funny to me is when they say resisting without violence. That's not resisting. That's like me saying, oh yeah, I went to the gym to lift weights without weights. Oh, I went to the coffee shop to not get coffee. Oh, I went jogging while I was sitting in the chair. But many of us, wow, it sounds stupid for me even to even say it. Many of us actually hear that and we believe it. We accept it as true. Why? Because we've heard it all of our lives. And the only thing we want to do is we don't want to get in trouble. We want to make sure everything is a-okay. Because if the police stop you, you must have did something. Because they wouldn't just do something. But then I go through and start to show you certain things. And then you start seeing video after video after video after video after video. At what point does it register that somebody's lying to you? At what point does it register that you can actually go read what the law is? At what point does it register that whenever I told you where to go, you could actually go there and see it? Sometimes these points hurt because they're meant to. Sometimes these points hurt because it's the mirror that's sitting in front of you. You're looking to do better, but it's because you already knew better. You knew of something that was said to you wasn't right and you didn't know why, but you also didn't want to break status quo. That's what did the this is why I need you to stay focused. That's one thing I kept telling John Melvin, I need you to stay focused. When I was talking to Officer Anderson, I need you to stay focused. I'm not just throwing this out here because you can't go to Harvard Law Review and find this. 
You can't do that. You can't go to a law, a law library and find this. No, you can't do that. No, I actually give you the cases. I've been doing that for years. Been doing it for years. I've been giving you breadcrumbs. But for many, it's not enough. I'm not going deep enough. But at the same time, <laughs> I said something before, and it was because, again, most of you guys know that Jay Z is one of my favorite artists. But it's one of those things that become the rationale for me. Because Jay-Z talked about, lyrically, I would be Talib Kweli. Many of you don't know Talib Kweli. Why? Because he is a thinker that raps. I'm saying that one more time. Talib Kweli is a thinker that raps. He is iconic in upstate New York. He is that dude. Jay-Z said, I would be Talib Kweli. He said, but I dumbed down for my audience, so I doubled my dollars. Talib Kweli is iconic in upstate New York. He doesn't have Jay-Z money because he refused to dumb down. Everyone on here tell me, thank you. You've given me something I never had, but... Everyone that says I've given them something have given me nothing. Here's a thumbs up. Here's a view. That thanks button is there. The donation links are there. The support links are there. So I sit down sometimes. I, I, as, at what point do I stop being Talib Kweli? Am I equating myself to that? I'm putting myself in a similar plane because I refuse to dumb down. But, just, just but, what if I dumb down for my audience? Would I double my dollars? Because I know you'll criticize me for it. But I gain more followers. Isn't that beautiful? Because even in this context, I'm giving you something of value. I'm giving you something that's going to not only be here today, tomorrow, it'll be here years from now. Because let's say they take it off Spotify, it's going to still be on iHeartRadio. It's going to still be on Apple. It's going to still be on 40 of your major podcasting platforms. Are you going to appreciate it then? Are you going to show appreciation for it then? But I need you to focus. Because even in the context of this, <laughs> you know the price of everything but the value of nothing. Sometimes I ask people, you know what? What is it that you could they'll tell? Oh, well, uh, well, man, that's a lot of money. I get it. I do get it. Trust me. I get it. That's a lot of money. And part of the reason I'm still doing this is because I didn't do it for the money. But I also understand self-investment. Because if you're refusing to invest in yourself, why in the hell would I invest in you? Right? Because my free investment is right now. That's what it is. But it's understanding this. Because here's, here's the greater part. Most of you that are listening will think this, this portion is about money. All he, oh, all he cares about them donations. There are very few who are actually going to catch the point of what I'm talking about. There are very few. I understand that. And I did that for a reason. Because even in the context of that, I gave you 
a baseline because I said a lot of things, but were you listening to what was being said? Were you able to hear? All right, <laughs> that lesson's over. But now let's understand. Kelsey was not precisely the complainant because she didn't call. She was not violent, so she was not resisting. She was not threatening because she wasn't speaking. And since there was no active resistance, and thus a jury could find Ernest's takedown maneuver was unreasonable. The context here was they were shifting focus. Whoops. But a lot of you didn't even catch that. They were shifting focus. They were shifting focus. I need you to stay focused. They were shifting focus. Because not only did they say she was not resisting, they actually brought up he was able to do what he did because she wasn't a complainant. She didn't call. She was the victim, but she didn't make the call for service. They separated her, although it was the exact same person. The force may only be used to overcome physical resistance or threatened force, which she was neither. And may not employ simply because a suspect is disagreeable. Which she was. Her walking away and not talking to him made her disagreeable. But they shifted the focus. And these are the things that you have to combat when you're dealing with this. And a lot of times when they hit you with that focus shift. People hit the, hit the default of, I need to defend myself. Now, the one thing I, I do, I actually talk about my father, and I talk about the, the things that he gave me. He gave me a lot of weapons when I was young. One was, he changed my default. He changed my default early. My default is to never defend myself in the context of, if you accuse me of something. Because at the end of the day, you accuse me of something, prove it. Because other than that, you can kiss my ass with your tongue out. Because at the end of the day, words are just words. Because even somebody said, oh, well, he, he owed child support. Yep. Because if I didn't, why would you say I did? Yes, I listen to too much music too. But understand that. I don't care. My care level is so low. And then as I've gotten older, my care level is so low. It, I almost, I almost have to actually force myself to pay attention. Because I care so little. Because I've lived my life with people saying some of the most horrible shit about me. And when they were confronted with actually producing what was required behind their, I, I, I told you, it was bullshit. I mean, just it was complete. And here's the great part. Even the true stuff, I don't care. Because all of the true stuff is what made me me. And I love me. Matter of fact, my low self-esteem is at an all-time high. Right now, I am, I'm Austin Reeves, I'm him. If you say I did it, I did it. Okay, let's get it. Now what? How does that change Terryville, Ohio? It doesn't. How does that change how I feel about you? I don't know you, so I don't really care. But again, the words... I'm not going to the default of, oh, I'm going to defend myself. No, I don't really care. Well, you hit somebody with a bat. You a bad person. I don't care. I probably did. I remember in the third grade, you kicked the girl off the swing. I probably did. I always tell people, 
I wasn't always a good person. Sometimes I don't even label myself as that now. It the only re- I, I'm kind of defaulted towards the good person thing because I don't care about anybody else, so I don't go around anybody and the people I do interact with. I'm smiling and pleasant because I'm doing what I want to do and I really don't care about them. Like, if our, if our auras and our happenstance happens to be at the same time, that is beautiful. Because I'm probably, if I don't feel it, I'm going to leave. If I don't like you, I'm probably going to tell you or I'm going to just leave them around you. I really don't get that invested in a lot of things. So, have your words, have whatever you need. But I'm not going to the default of defending. And most people do. Why? Because that's what we're programmed to do. Oh, he said something about my mama. I don't care. Oh, your mama stank. Yeah, she probably do. She's been dead for a long time. I I mean, they told my... (laughs) My son asked me one day, he said, how do you, how do you play ball when somebody's talking trash for you? I told him, I said, here's the crazy part. I said, people said some horrible shit about your mama. Really don't care. But, you know, because if you hear some of the trash talk that people say, it's just to get into your head. Can they take space in your head? My ego is entirely too big for people to take up space in my head. Now, have I sat down and felt petty? Absolutely. I've actually thought about coming up with a show. I've, I've gone as far as going to build a bear and picking out a bear that I'm going to dress like me and have days where I'm just going to be petty. Like, you know, because you get it, petty rucksman. But anyway, I, I but... That's about as much care as you're going to get from me. I Because I don't care. I look, I look at some of the comments. I, and it's, and it's, it's hilarious to me. Because even, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you one. Then I'm going to get back because I need to remain focused. Because again, notice how I just go off into a tangent. And the focus shift. This is one of the things that I want you to stay cognizant of. Staying focused. Ah, that's some good yak there. Now, Esler versus city, city of Rapid City, wherein it held that an officer did not violate the Fourth Amendment by using force against a nonviolent misdemeanor who continued to walk away after being ordered twice to place his hands behind his back. Now, one of the great parts about this is because of this podcast, I'm going to do a video this week. It is going to be dropping in the next day or so of what makes a police quote-unquote order lawful. Because they love to say, well, you you were given a lawful order. What made it lawful? Because remember... If they give you an order absent a crime, it's a show of authority stop, which is illegal based on Terry v. Ohio, based on the reasonable officer would have known standard. Texas, yes. Georgia, not so much. Keep that in mind because, again, it's called a show of authority stop. So what will make an officer... Say, I'm going, you you can't walk away from me. Place your hands behind your back. What made that order lawful? Because again, if that was a detention and he just wanted someone to talk to, that arrest is now illegal. Whoops. So when you're given, you know, partials of this, this is why you can now go back and kind of look at that case just to see. Just to see what made that order lawful. Now, getting back to the focus. Ernest alleged that Kelsey was 
perceived by all officers and objective witness present to be aggressive, resisting, and non-compliant. Now, you remember I told you in, in Matt Ernest's report, he said Melanie was someone who was the victim because she was assaulted. He also said in his report he didn't talk to her. He later put in his report that she was perceived by all officers and objective witnesses. The same objective witnesses that called and said she was assaulted. Yet she didn't say she was assaulted. They said that she was aggressive. They said that she was resisting. They said she was non-compliant. And this is why you challenge the officer's report. You get their body cam footage and challenge their character. Because Matt Ernest is a bad cop. I guarantee you this is not the first time he's done that. Because the one thing I've learned is every child tries to find the boundaries. Where's that line that I don't cross? And they continue to escalate until they find that line. If they don't ever find that line, they continue the escalation. I guarantee the stock language, because what he did not understand was the fact that he wrote. He didn't talk to her. He wrote that she was the victim. He wrote that she didn't want to talk to him and walked away. So then how could he write that she was aggressive, that she was resisting, and she was non-compliant? Because the only thing she technically was was non-compliant. But here's the great part about it. She was not part of a crime to where co compliance was necessary. He was still in a service capacity. But notice how he attempted to cover his own ass. By using the word non-compliant. She was non-compliant. She also wasn't under arrest because she was not part of a crime. So he was still a servant to her. Because he also did not complete the totality of circumstances because he didn't speak to her. Nor did he listen to her when she gave him instructions. But see how the focus shift. I need you to stay focused. I want you to think about this. How many times have we seen the body cam footage doesn't match the officer's account of events? His police report didn't even match his police report. But they still tried to shift the focus. Because remember, police officers are entitled to qualified immunity unless Existing precedent squarely governs the specific facts at issue. Here's the context of this one. Because they allowed, the district court allowed, and this is where a lot of people get thrown off at. Because this is where I always tell people, what is your level of, or I always ask people, what is your level of justice? Because when they do something, because no matter how something is structured, no matter how much you're willing to look at it, how far are you willing to fight to get what you want? How much? That's the only question I always ask. Because if I find the thing you're willing to die for, it's easier for me to fight. Because if you look at Turner v. Driver, Turner hand wrote his case that he went all the way to the Supreme Court to create a precedence for videotaping the police officers. Why? Because the officers had violated his First Amendment rights by arresting him for doing nothing more than videotaping them while they were performing their duties. He was denied on two separate occasions after spending money. But he continued the fight. 
I'm going to say he was denied on two separate occasions. After spending money. And he continued the fight and won. Because he was looking for that level of justice. Once he got it, he was good. How, how far are you willing to go? What is your level of justice? What are you willing to fight for? Because Kelsey lost in the district court. Why? Because none squarely governed the specific facts at issue. Why was that? Because while she was non-threatening and a misdemeanor, the problem was she wasn't a misdemeanor. She was non-threatening, but she was not a misdemeanor. There's no precedent for that. She was not fleeing. She was not resisting arrest, but she was ignoring the officer. But here's the thing. They kept using the word command, command, command. And nobody on Kelsey's team picked up on that. I'm going to say that again. They kept using the word command, officer's command, officer's command. And they never challenged that. Because if she was the victim and she had already stated she was not a misdemeanor. She was not a criminal. So therefore, he was still in a servant's place. And any command would have been illegal. Whoops. Because of Terry B. Ohio. And he would have known that. Because a reasonable officer would have known that. But they didn't stay focused. Because her team did not catch that. And thus, violated, did not violate the individual's right to be free of excessive force. Because just as you have to be specific to the... Let me, let me slow down. Let me, let me slow down. Just as you have to be specific to the particular situation that the officer violated a protected right, they have to be specific in their court responses to your motions and your applications that you present for that particular case or particular situation. Specificity is not their friend, which is why they use stock language, which is why they use the word command. Oh, I gave her a command or I gave her a lawful command. What made it lawful? Because she was the victim. He didn't perform his duties correctly. And if he gave her a lawful command, what made it lawful? Because he was still in a service place and a servant can't give commands to their master. Whoops. Whoops. Because I'm going to get into that too. Because it's going to go under the Supreme Trust banner. But it's going under Supreme Decision. Because I want you to understand the context of fiduciary. When I say they have a fiduciary duty, when I talk about the Constitution as a trust document, when I talk about getting their oath of office, why? Because they're signing. They're signing that trust document to the people. Whoops. Whoops. Because as a fiduciary, they must work towards the benefit of the people. Whoops. So when they don't do that, they become liable individually in their individual capacity because when they act outside of their duties, they are no longer representatives of the government. Matt Ernest, who's a bad cop, acted outside of his governmental duties. He acted outside of his fiduciary duties. He was individually liable. But here's the thing. They did not catch the verbiage. Don't worry about it because I need you to stay focused. Now, when we're going through things, I'm going to give you a case. Hope B. Pelzer. 
I give you, I, hell, I gave you a ton of cases. I'm going to give you a few more. But it's talking about certain things that are situational and materially similar in fact. Say that again. Hope B. Pelzer, I gave you these cases because they are subjective. Because when you're going up against clearly established, you're looking for things that are materially similar in facts. Why did I say they was offering her, uh, offering Matt, who was a bad cop, qualified immunity? Is because there were no cases, none. That an officer gave commands to a person that was not a misdemeanor and then assaulted them. And understand the context. As much as we like to go through certain things, there's nothing new under the sun. Are there ways that are there other ways that could have that could have been <coughs> excuse me absolutely let me take let me, let me pause for this commercial break mm. that's some good yak are there other ways that case could have been handled absolutely are there other things that I would have done specifically with the verbiage absolutely however. Do I think they did a bad thing with? No. I think they saw something and they stayed with it. Because that was the second part of it. They consistently harped on the exact same things and they focused on the fact that she was not a criminal. They just never attacked the officer. Why? Because piranha don't eat piranha. And I get tired of telling people that because they love to say, well, I went to my attorney and he said. Or they'll regurgitate and say, oh, my attorney said exactly what you did. And I'll be like, how much you pay him? Well, I pay him $8,000. But you'll complain about giving me 100 <laughs> But I need you to stay focused. Anyway. Existing precedent must squarely govern the specific facts at issue. A body of relevant case law is usually necessary. That is the importance of specificity. That body of case law that's going direct to the subject. Courts that allow general principles developed through prior case law to establish the law will be more likely to deny qualified immunity in a variety of circumstances, whereas courts that require factual identical cases will almost always grant qualified immunity. Now, let me, let me dissect that. There, there are courts in this country that are more, I, I hate to use the word, they're more apt to the to offer someone qualified immunity if every situation that you are pointing out does not have a case that supports every action that you're pointing out. Because there is a thing as being too specific or giving too many details. There's a thing for that. And there are cases where you can not give enough details or you don't have enough case law that backs the details that you are given. So while it's a double-edged sword, it's understanding how to kind of walk that line. And many of us, you know, I had to learn the hard way because I was one of those, I'm going to finna just talk about everything. Nobody needs to know everything. Nobody cares about everything. You know, because there's a, there's a saying, you know, 90% of people don't care about your problems and 10% do. And the 10% they gave um, do care about your problems are the ones they gave them to you. So it's understanding while that small group is the one that has your focus, 
it's also important to remain focused on what it is that is actually bothering you. Now, because rather a reasonable official would recognize that her, his or her conduct violates clearly established constitutional law is highly determined by comparing the facts of his or her scenario to the facts of the relevant cases that define the scope of that right. Now, I often tell people the easy place to go is, again, Harvard Law Review because they have the most extensive case um, case studies that I've actually gone through. And, you know, Princeton has a few, Princeton Law Journal, Cornell. All of these places have access to free law. Why do I keep telling people that? Because I know you're not going. There are some people that'll go, they'll go for a little while. They'll go for a couple months. And then they'll stop. And then they'll go back. And then they'll stop. You know why? Because now you're in a free race. When it's easy and it's convenient and you're not behind the gun. That's when people call me. When they're behind the gun. When they can't see the things that I'm saying. When they have, you know what my favorite is? I'll call you next week. I never expect those calls back. Or the or my absolute favorite. You know what? I, 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 as soon as I get this settlement, you know, I'm going to break you off. That is almost like a leprechaun riding a unicorn. That's it's it's happened. Trust me, it's happened. But that is more rare than you know a spotted a spotted lion in zebra clothes. Like it's 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 happened. But I, I don't know. I don't look for it. And the greatest part is for those that have blessed me. I don't have to ask. I didn't have to look for them. And they didn't have to tell me. They just did it. Those are the things that I love. Because even a couple of my followers. I didn't. I didn't ask for a lot of things. And I was blessed with some things. Just on you know on a humble. But. It's those blessings that I appreciate. And you know what. I need you to stay focused. I love do, doing these little things like this because I want you to understand that these tips and tricks I give you are the things that are being used against you. These are the things that are taking you out of the zones that you're looking to be in. These are the things that are going to be set out in front of you to distract you. These are the things that will cause you to miss certain things such as command to someone who is not a criminal which means that command they have made was illegal. And remember, I told you you can't argue with yourself because either you were lying then or you're lying now. You said that you gave me a command. Whoops. You admitted to illegality. How do you lose qualified immunity? I'm going to get into that because I gave you two. But I'm going to give you something else because the context of it is delivered and accepted differently because they gave you an overlay because it's two questions you got to answer. You got to answer yes to it. The clearly established and would he have already known. We've got those. But see, I've got the I've got the long version version of ready. But anyway, because understanding the semantics of an argument. The argument of not following commands when given by a police officer not being clearly established are here. Terry v. Ohio, 1968, which every officer in the country is supposed to be trained on. And the Fifth Amendment, September 17, 1787, the right to remain silent. Florida v. Royer, 1983 clearly established 
not speaking to police is clearly, clearly established. So you have to understand how these kind of go into, because again, if 1778 ain't clear enough for establishment of the right to remain silent and not talk to police, that they signed an oath of office to uphold and defend, is amazing to me. Because you remember I gave you the story about the young man in Georgia who was talking to the young lady whose um, boyfriend, he had killed himself in a hotel. And I told him and showed him the Georgia Constitution where it says he's amenable to me at all times, which he had never read, but he had signed an oath to uphold and defend. I'm going to say that one more time. I showed him what the Constitution of the state of Georgia said. He had signed an oath and filed it to uphold and defend that Constitution and that saying he had never read it. A lot of times we give them more credit than they deserve. But at the end of the day, it's the understanding of Jordan v. City of Prince. It's the understanding Malley v. Briggs. It's the understanding of knowing who you are and understanding the context and understanding if they give you a command, it's already clearly established that a reasonable officer would know that you don't have to talk to them. Now, Graham v. Connor, 490 U.S. 36, uh, 386, 1989. The court explained that whether a use of force is reasonable depends on the facts, including the severity of the crime at issue, whether the suspect posed an um, immediate threat to the safety of the officers or other, and whether he is actively resisting or attempting to evade arrest by flight. Now, according to Graham v. Connor, there was no crime, so there was no severity. There was no threat to the safety of the police officer or others. And she was not resisting, even according to Matt's own statement. But notice, that in itself, requires an officer to perform the totality of circumstances prior to acting, which Ernest did not do, which makes Matt Ernest a bad cop. Now, the biggest reason why I do this is because it's one of the things that allows us to level the playing field. That was actually one of the series I was going to do but, yeah, it didn't get a lot of support from it, so I kind of x that one out and moving on to the next. But, I want you to understand something. The idea of qualified immunity is, one, acting within the scope of the officer's office. Was that something that the officer was doing at the time? Now, in this case, was he acting in the scope of his office when he came to the scene? Absolutely, because he was called by an assault. Did he perform the takedown in an objective good faith? That answer is no. But notice, we're not using the two-prong that the court used. So therefore, now we use the two-prong. Did he violate a constitutionally protected act? Absolutely. Was that clearly established? Absolutely. Because she was not resisting. Because she was the victim. Not the commitment of a crime. Now, did 
he violate an established statutory or constitutional right which a reasonable officer would be aware of. Absolutely. 1787, September 7th. She doesn't have to speak to him. The reason why we're having this conversation is because she found her justice. She set a precedent. Because at the end of the day, how do you lose qualified immunity? Now, I, 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 I want you to understand something. It is done through the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law. If his actions were outside the scope of his office, which they were. And he performed it because he actually used the word command after saying she was the victim. He did it anyway. He did it because he was incompetent, which means Matt Ernest is a bad officer. And does not know law. So how can he enforce law? Because his level of incompetency. Let's say he knew everything he did was wrong. Then he knew his actions were also outside the scope of his duties. He also knew his actions violated her constitutional right. Which made him a willful participant. In violating her constitutional rights. Which makes him a bad cop. And he loses qualified. Because remember I told you there's two ways that you lose qualified immunity. I've been saying it for years. Incompetency. And willful acts. Now. When you lay those down. Why do you think. Whenever you hear these officers that are being sued. Or being. Uh, well mostly. Mostly. Sued for wrongful death. You hear the hear the words negligence. They acted negligently. They acted recklessly. Because those are synonyms for incompetent. Those are synonyms for saying they acted outside the scope of their duties. So when you're being told, oh, well, police officers can do this because, or oh, it's their word against yours. Yes, but it's a way to put them on blast. It's a way to actually execute the things that you, because I've always said this, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. If you're just paying these folks every time they say something to you, you're part of the problem. If you're challenging and requiring that they police you properly, I salute you. Because if those that enforce and make laws, I'm going to always have smoke for them. For everybody else that don't like the things I do, I think you should just keep quiet. And I love you guys. And please forgive me. That's just my passion talking.